Two random variables walked into a bar, but they thought they were being discreet, but I heard them continuously chatter. Get it? Discreet and continuous. And we are talking about random variables today. So let me just ask you, what's fair? You and your friend wager on heads or tails. If he bets a dollar on heads, what is a fair wager for you to make on tails? Well, heads, he's going to win, right? Tails, you're going to win. Payout, so if he gets heads, you lose a dollar. And the probability of that is a half. So we're thinking, okay, do a dollar for the tails. Does that work out? We go ahead and multiply these two. So if we did 100 plays, we would expect you to uh, lose $50, and we would expect you to win $50. So on average, we would expect you to come out even. So that would be fair. All right, so that's a very easy example with heads and tails. What about if we roll a die, and now you're betting a dollar on just winning if you get a six, all right? What is a fair wager for him to make on the rest of the outcomes? So the outcomes are one through five and six. If one through five come up, you lose a dollar, right? What should the pay be? Well, let's look at the probability for you losing a dollar. Five out of six times, you're going to lose a dollar, which means one out of six times, you're going to win. If we did 60 plays, we would expect, and so those probabilities add up to one. That's important. If we did 60 plays, we would expect you to win, uh, sorry, to lose 50 of them. So you'd lose $50. That's a lot. And we would only expect you to win 10 of them, right? So we should get a total of $0 if it's a fair game. So if you're losing $50, how much money do you need to make on the other 10 plays to come out even? Well, you would need to make basically $5. So um, five dollars would seem like a fair bet on one to five to match the one dollar on the six bet because then you would expect to lose 50 and gain 50 over 60 plays so you come out even. What this is called is a probability model with random variables where we have a quantitative variable here and a probability associated with it and we have different values for this. So the outcomes of Plus a dollar, minus a dollar, or plus five dollars are all random variables. And they're denoted by X, Y, or Z, or some other capital letter, or you can even use a word. So it doesn't have to just be, you know, X, Y, or Z. A uh, random variable assumes any of several different values as a result of some random event, whether you're rolling die, flipping a coin, whatever. Discrete random var variables take a value which be, can be counted. So like the example we did with the wagers. Continuous random variables can take any value in a specified range. And we're going to talk just a little bit about continuous, but today we are focusing on discrete. But at the end, I'll talk just a little bit about continuous. So creating a probability model. The collection of all the outcomes and associated probabilities usually organized in the form of a table or a tree diagram or a formula, all right? For the probability model to be valid, the following has to be true. All the probabilities have to be somewhere from zero to one. So it can be zero, it can be one, but it can't be 1.2 and it can't be negative. In addition, the sum of all the probabilities must equal one. If it doesn't add up to one, you either have a miscalculation or you left out an outcome. All right, so we're going to consider a dice game where there are no winnings for rolling a one, two, or three, and you get five dollars for a four or five, and six and fifty dollars for a six. So we're going to create a probability model for this. All right, so there's your winnings: is zero dollars, five dollars, and fifty dollars. What's the probability that you'll win zero half the time? Because it's three out of six rolls. How about five dollars? Well, there are two out of six equally likely rolls, so about a third. And for the $50, it would be one six. All right. So we know that this model's fine because the probabilities do add up to one. And just to let you know, you can write it as P of $50. That's the same as saying P of X equals $50. So just a little notation advice there. All right. So now I'm going to give you a probability model that I already put together. And I create this five question quiz. And you know, some kids, don't study sometimes. I know, right? And I determined the probability that a kid who didn't study, who knows nothing, 
what's the probability they get a certain number of questions right on my quiz, all right? I did actually use a technique to do it, but I haven't taught that to you yet, and I actually adjusted the numbers a little bit. All right, is this probability model that I put together valid? Now, don't worry about the technique I used. All we're checking is, does it follow the rules? First of all, all my probabilities are between 0 and 1. I could have had a 0, and actually in real life, if you calculate it, that's pretty darn close to 0. So you're guessing five questions right on a multiple choice quiz, getting them all right, eh, not so hot. So let's check the other part. Do these all add up to 1? Well, we add the 0 0.24, 0 0.40, 0 0.25, 0 0.07, 0 0.03, and 0 0.01. Yes, they do add up to 1. Now. For this quiz, we're going to say a student who gets at least three questions correct passes. So what's the probability a student passes? Well, that would be these kiddos right here. So we just add up the probability for getting three right, four right, or five right. In this case, we would expect 11% of kids to pass uh, this quiz if they were just guessing. Okay, what is the probability that a student gets more than three questions right? So actually pay attention to these words, at least three includes three. So you'd be doing three, four, and five. More than three means we're limiting ourselves to just four and five, all right? So I would just add those probabilities for um, four correct questions and five correct questions. What's the probability that a student gets at most two questions correct? So that means zero, one, or two. So I would add up these three probabilities right here and it would be 89%. What is the probability that a student gets less than two questions correct? Well, the less thans are zero and one, all right? So 64% of the time. So a huge, over half the time, a kiddo is not even gonna get more than one question correct on this quiz. All right, so let's say I wanted to know how many on average uh, questions do I expect a student to get right on this quiz? Well, we had the probabilities just now, right? But there is a way to predict the average. Let's just start by imagining 100 students. So if 24% of the time my kiddos get none correct, I would expect 24 students to be in that category. And then 40 for getting one right, 25 for two, seven for three, three for four, and just one kiddo to get all five right. So I could just say, okay, let me just count up how many total correct questions there are. Well, for the kiddos who got zero, that's still zero. For the 40 kids who got one question right, that's 40 questions that are right. And, and I'm talking about the total here, all right? Uh, the 25 kids who got two, that gives me 50. The seven kids who got three gives me 21. The three kids who got four, give me 12. And the one kid who gets all five right gives me five. And when I add those all up, I get 128. So on average, how many do I expect one kid to get right? Well, that's 128 spread out over 100 kids, right? So I just divide by 100. So we average this out to 1.28 expected correct answers per student. And this is called the expected value. That means it's a theoretical long run average value. It's the center of the model. Um, it's like a balancing point. It's not what will happen, it's what we expect to happen. It is denoted by E of X and sometimes mu uh, when you're talking about population mean. And a lot of the times here, because we do the whole distribution and all our probabilities add up to one, we actually do have a population mean. It is found by summing the products of variable values and associated probabilities. And this is the fancy formula for it that's on your math chart. So now I'm gonna interpret the expected value for the number of answers correct on a quiz. So if many, many students took this quiz and we just guessed or they just guessed, the average number of correct answers per student is about, notice I underlined the about, we don't say it will be, it is about 1.28 correct questions. Now, do we actually expect a student to get 1.28 questions correct? No, that's impossible. Uh, it's just the expected average over many trials. All right, now I'm gonna give you a great tool, Staplet, 
uh, has a discrete variable function, all right? And we can use it to create histograms and it will also calculate your mean and your standard deviation. So let me go ahead and show you. So basically we go to this staplet.com. If you didn't, uh, I showed you where to find it from the main, but if you just put discrete, it'll take you straight here. Put in the variable name and the values. And you'll notice it only starts with two rows. So you got to hit that plus button to add extra rows. Since we have six outcomes, I actually had to add a couple of rows. All right. And then once I'm done, I click on begin analysis right there. And you can see the graph and I'm scrolling down here. And if you float over the bars, it will actually show you the percentages in each bar. And you have the mean and summary statistics at the bottom. All right. So the mean, here's the summary statistics, now it's easier to see, is 1.28, which is what we calculated, so that's good. That's kind of the balancing point. So for a distribution, if we know where the mean is and if we were to graph it, we could actually balance it. If I actually cut that paper shape out, it would balance at 1.28, which is kind of cool. All right, so let's go ahead and describe this distribution using CUS because we want to be able to describe any distribution. The center, well, we can use the mean or the median, all right? The mean is 1.28 questions correct. The median, how do I know the median is one question correct? Well, I got over 20% here and 40% here. So the first 50%, I'm going to hit the one. So that's definitely your median. I could also figure out that, guess what? One's Q1 as well, all right? And I bet you that Q3 is two, just saying. All right, so I could figure out some of my other numbers. The unusual features, not really anything super unusual, no outliers, no gaps, nothing like that. I would definitely say unimodal, just one peak, and definitely skewed to the right, all right? The standard deviation, since I have it, is 1.059 questions, correct? So use the standard deviation if you have it. Uh, I could do min to max. In this case, I know it's from 0 to 5. And you see how this uh, thing does sort of center on your point. And uh, that's because it's trying to uh, simulate continuous as well with these discrete numbers. So that's fine. All right. So now let's go ahead and go back to our dice game. All right. And we're going to go ahead and practice by calculating the expected value for this one. So we have these values from before, which add up to one. I'm going to just multiply them across zero times three, six, five times two, six is 10, six, 50 times one, six is five, six. So the expected winnings on this is $10. All right. Now, when you're taking the AP test, you're probably not going to have a table they're going to want you to write the calculation out. So they're going to basically, using that fancy formula, you take your X times the probability for that X, and you just keep going until you're done. And that equals $10. So this is exactly the same work here as what we did by multiplying these two columns to get that. All right, don't worry about this just yet. All right, so let's interpret the expected value. Over many, many plays, we would expect the average winnings to be $10. So we would expect the average to be here. Notice nobody wins $10, right? Because they either win five, zero, or 50. But on average, we expect them to win 10. Now you could say, well, Ms. Soberman, that's not a very symmetric graph. Why are we using the average instead of the median? Well, first of all, the median is $0, right? But if I were, let's say I was doing the game and I was trying to figure out how much to charge for a ticket or budget how much money people are going to win. If I use the median in this case, I'm going to assume it's zero dollars, right? But the mean helps me figure out over many, many plays, we can kind of budget for a total. All right. Now let's get to variance and standard deviation. So standard deviation of a random variable, sigma of x. Now we've seen s of x before. Sigma of x is for a population. And it measures how much the values of the variable typically vary from the mean in many, many trials of the random process. And there is a formula. It's x minus mu. So it's each value minus mu. And I'll show you in a table. Actually, we'll show you in a calculation here. Times the probability for that particular value. 
And this symbol here means sum, sigma added up. Oh, oh, and by the way, this is also called sigma. Is that not too confusing? It's horrible. So this is actually the variance, which is sigma squared, not to be confused with standard deviation, which is just sigma. All right, so let's go ahead and do uh, the calculation first for variance, because that's easier. This formula is written for variance. So sigma squared, the variance, my first value was 0. My average was 10. I'm going to square it, and the probability of getting 0 was 0.5. My second value was 5. Subtract the mean, square it, and the probability of getting a 5 was about a third. All right. Uh, then the, well, it was a third. It's about 0.333. All right. Then my last value was 50. Subtract the mean, square it, and multiply it by 0.167. And I get an ugly number, roughly 325. Well, I can take the square root of that to get the standard deviation, and it's about 18.03. So how do I interpret this? This is where this piece comes into play. The winnings typically vary by about whatever the standard deviation is from the mean. So by about $18.03 from the mean winnings of $10. So that tells you about how much it varies. All right, on average. Okay, you can also use it for the table. So like that calculation where I did the uh, difference there and squared it, and then just multiply it by these probabilities here, and then add it up, and then take the square root. So you can also do a table. But I will say the Staplet does calculate it automatically. Um, you could be expected to write down the formula. So you might be, and I'll show that to you in just a sec. Or, oh, actually, yeah, I'll show not sure if I'm going to show it to you, but basically for this, if I asked you to write it down, you would go to 0 minus 10 squared times 0 0.5 plus this thing plus that thing, and that would be your variance, and then you would take the square root. So kind of like what we did, actually, just like we did in the previous slide. Here, let me go. All slides. You're going to see the end. Don't look at the end. So you would be expected to be able to write this down on your AP exam. That's, yeah, I knew I did it. So, and this is just table work right here. Okay, so now we're gonna come to a really interesting problem. We have two parents decide to have children until they have two girls or, because you never know, I mean, you don't want a dozen boys, not that I don't like boys, but a dozen's a lot of kids, right? So they said, we're gonna try for two girls or five kids. We're gonna stop after the fifth one, no matter what we get, all right? So we're going to construct the probability model for how many kids are, is this family going to end up with? We know they're going to have at least two because they're going to try at least twice, right? They may get girl, girl on the first try. Or they could end up with all five boys. So let's go through the tree. First of all, first kiddo, boy or girl. Now we're definitely having another kiddo after this. So there are they are. Oops, I'm going to just do the top one. So if... They have the second kid is a boy, and um, then they got to keep trying again, right? So I'm going to just keep going along the top branch until they hit two girls. So this family right here is a five-boy family, all right? And then this family has four boys and one girl. This family also has four boys and one girl. And then this family has actually two girls. All right, so I'm going to keep doing the tree here. And this family this family is going to try again. Here they stop for the girl. All right, and there we go. So this is an end of a branch right there. Okay, so I just keep using that rule. If I get two girls, I stop. This one they got to try again. This one they got to try again. All right, now this family, they started off with a girl. So I bet you there are less branches down here. So... Here, if they have a girl there, oh, they're done, right? Uh, but if they have a boy, they're going to try again. And same thing there and there. So what are all these sample spaces? Well, we've got a five-boy family. What's the probability of that happening? One-half times one-half times one-half times one-half times one-half. So 1 over 32. So it's point. 03125. So these are all the outcomes from the top half of the tree. See this last one right here is boy, girl, girl. 
And so this one's only cute. These are not equally likely because sometimes they stop short when they hit their goal. All right. How about these families down here? We have girl, 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 boy, girl, girl, boy, boy, girl, girl, boy, 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 girl, and girl, boy, boy, you know, all boys. So there they are. And then every time for every kid, there's a half probability that we're multiplying out. That little carrot there means to the fifth power. All right, so then what I can do is count up the number of kids. The smallest family is two, and we go up to five, right? What's the probability of two kids? Well, there's only one time that happens right there, right? Because otherwise they're, they're trying again. So then that happens one half times one half, which is one quarter. Now, how many of these families have three kids? We've got these two are just three kid families, right? So I'm just going to add those two probabilities, and guess what? I got a half again. All right, how about four kids? Let me highlight the four kid family. There's only three of those, which is kind of weird because before it was a little more symmetric. And I get 0.1875. Then everybody else is a five kid family. All right, there are 10 five kid families here. That's crazy. All right, they all add up to one, so it's good. Now that I have this model, I can plug this in Staplet to get a nice histogram and it'll calculate my expected value and my standard deviation to make my life easier. Now I could, if I, I could be asked to show the calculation and I will expect you to be able to do it for me as well. You go 2 times 0.25, 3 times 0.25, 4 times 0.1875, 5 times 3, 0.3125, add them up and that would be give you your expected value. And then the standard deviation, well, I'd have to figure out the mean first. So I would do 2 minus whatever the mean is squared times the 0.25, kind of like I did in the previous example. All right, so here's the distribution that Staplet kicked out for me. And the mean is just over 3.5 kids, 3.563. So let's describe the distribution. The center is, there's my mean. And the median, believe it or not, the first two, if you looked at that previous model here, we have 50% of the families are nice and evenly split. See that? We got 25% have two kids, 25% have three kids, and then it gets kind of interesting here. So the median is right on that line between three and four. So the median is halfway between three and four, 3.5. Nothing unusual in terms of gaps or outliers. And I would actually call this um, uh, roughly symmetric. Actually, I should, would call this roughly uniform. I should say uniform there. In fact, I don't think I can type. Um, put uniform down here. All right. And then the standard deviation is 1.17 children. All right. So now let's interpret the expected value. For many, many similar families who do the same thing, we expect them to have an average of 3.563 children. All right. The standard deviation is the distance. It's kind of like an average distance between the values and the mean. So how do I interpret this 1.171? For many, many similar families, we expect the family size to vary by about 1.17 children from the mean of 3.563 children. OK, um, what is the probability they will at, uh, have, pretend there's a have, at most four children. Well, okay, at most four means uh, it would be the two, the three, and the four children count. So I would just add up these values, all right? Or I could say, hey, wait a second, only one of these families doesn't count. I can subtract that number from one and I will get it correct. All right, how about at least four children? Well, that means four or five, right? And then when I add those up, Oh, okay, half 0.5. When I add these two together, I get 50%. All right, now we have one other type of distribution to look at. It's We're not really going to be calculating standard deviations on these because it's more complicated with continuous distributions. So what are the continuous distributions? What happens is I don't have like a table with different values. I have a continuous range of values. And you've already been working with one continuous distribution called the normal distribution. Remember how we calculated the areas for the probabilities? So what could, nor uh, what could continuous distributions be used for? Height, weight, age, time, distance, speed, 
anything where I can keep chopping down the value into tinier and tinier and tinier units until who knows what. All right. So you've already learned about the normal distribution and some things that all of these distributions share. Some of the key properties is the total area under the curve is always one. Probabilities are assigned to intervals, not individual values. When we had table A, it was always for an interval starting from, you know, minus infinity, the very beginning up to our value. So it was always a range we were talking about. You're going to use the area under the curve, just like we did in table A, to find the uh, probability for an interval. So, and because it's intervals, it doesn't really matter if we say probability that x is greater than a number or x is greater than or equal to a number. Those are the same thing, all right? They're the same thing, which means the probability that x exactly equals a number on a continuous distribution is actually zero. Why is that? Because we just have one point with no width and the area is zero. Very strange, yes? Now there's a special type of uh, continuous distribution as well called the uniform distribution. And that's when all the outcomes in the specified range are equally likely. So here's an example I came up with. Um, I do not run red lights. I'm a good girl. And I patiently wait for them to turn green. And I notice that when I drive to school, the red light at A.W. Grimes and Gatta School Road, you know the one, I can wait anywhere from one to 90 seconds. I should say zero. Change that to zero there. Sorry. Uh, for the light to turn green. Sketch the probability distribution for how long I wait at the red light. Okay. So, because I could get there and all of a sudden it's Boom, right? So wh what is the probability I wait more than 30 seconds? Well, first of all, let's sketch the distribution. My range, my height is going to be 1 out of 90 because my range is 90. That's why that needs to be a 0, by the way. So I'm starting at 0 and my graph is good. And 1 ninth is about 0 0.0111 repeating, all right? And so there's a probability from 0 to 90. After that, it drops to 0 because after 90 seconds, the light's going to turn for sure. All right. So what's the probability I wait for more than 30 seconds? Remember, that's going to be the area under the curve. And this is a nice, easy rectangle. We're good at these. So that's just base times height. So my height is one, not 1 over 90. My base is going to be from the 30 seconds to the 90, which is 60 seconds. And I get six ninths or two thirds, which kind of makes sense. If I kind of draw it right there, that's two thirds of the graph. How about that I wait exactly 30 seconds? Well, the problem is my base is going to be zero. So my probability is zero. And then finally, and we might talk about this in um, binomial approximations. What is probability I wait between 29.5 and 30.5 seconds? Then my width is one. And so it's one ninetieth that I wait around that amount of time.